Thank you, Isetta, for that introduction. Good evening, everyone. I am Matisse Spadola, the owner and founder director of Gallery Matisse. I will be serving as the moderator this evening. And joining me on stage is Tony Chapman, Monica Ikebu, and virtually Dorita Martin. So we are celebrating tonight, during Women's History Month, the contributions of three African American women artists their contributions to the American art canon and interpretation of the future of blackness. Um, each artist was asked to create work forged in their African ancestry and Afro-futurism ideologies. Tonight, I'll delve into the impulses that drive their practices, and as creatives, I'll ask them to share their perspectives as black women artists, mothers, daughters, and wives, and their role as translators and historians of the black experience. As a framework for our discussion, I will read just a brief excerpt from the curatorial statement. Blackness and the possibilities of its future are the impulses that drive the imaginations of African-American artists who draw inspiration from Afrofuturism, Black existentialism, spirituality, and futurist thought to construct a universe of tomorrow. Imagery rooted in nuances of the Black experience offers counter narratives that confront fictionalized characterizations of African Americans and cultural otherness and offers in place of them the essence of black humanity. In the Afrofuturist manifesto, Blackness Reimagined, artists assert agency over narratives of black life, offer discourse into the social political concerns of African Americans, and pays tribute and pay tribute to the resiliency, creativity, and spirituality that have historically sustained black people. So the exhibition was curated around three central themes, time, space, and existence. This evening, we're going to focus on the theme of space, which takes on two forms in the works. The first is manifestation of black consciousness and, social, and Afro features philosophy of freedom and self-determination. And then the second 
is the existence of blackness, represented through a egalitarian society of the future. The progressive and futuristic vision of African Americans imagined emancipated from a Eurocentric lens. So I'm going to begin by introducing you and having my conversation with Belinda Martin, who's joining us virtually. Belinda, are you there? Delita, if you can hear me, I believe you're on mute. Yes, I can hear you. So I'm going to read an excerpt from the curatorial statement. Your work is centered around space. And in the statement it says that the prince come with me to the place where I remember you and visionary, explore black women's spirituality and ascent to a higher self. The overlapping of portraits, patterns, colors, and textures form liminal spaces called veil escapes as portals to where the spiritual and worldly worlds exist. So, Davina, can you share with us why you chose space as a theme to explore the future of black women? Just barely, I think we are going to have to get some assistance with the audio. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's great. That's perfect. Yes? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's great. That's perfect. Okay, wonderful. Yes. Uh, yes. Can you hear me now? play many different roles in our lives and we wear many different hats and because we occupy and occupy these roles we occupy many different spaces can you hear me yes i can okay i'm sorry um, we we occupy um many different spaces and even um you know, we even birth people and individuals into spaces. 
But historically, and even today, we are constantly being relegated to spaces and put in our places. So as an artist, as a Black woman, I feel it's important for me to be able to um, not just create a space to exist, but a space to thrive. And that is my hope and what I um, try to do in my work is create spaces for Black women to thrive and to be able to tell their story. Thank you. And you do that through the intentional purpose of uh, and during, in your practice and creating the work, um, you lay down patterns and colors. Um, and we're looking at visionary. And, and there are a lot of symbolisms in your work as well. So, um, and then the color, the use of color is very intentional. So talk to us about, let's start with looking at the bird. And can you tell us about what the bird symbolizes in visionary? I'm sorry, Ms. Dixon, please repeat the question. Yes, the question is about the symbology, the various uh, symbolisms in your work. And I wonder if you could start with the bird. Lita, are you with us? Lita, are you with us? I'm unable to actually hear you. to move forward with um, speaking with Monica and allow the tech people to try to figure out what's going on with our audio. Monica, <laughs> you are a painter who draws from the form of realism in creating works that speak to black youth. For the exhibition, you chose existence as the theme to draw from and create. Um, I'm going to read an excerpt from the curatorial statement the framework of your work, the paintings you created, and interpreting the inherent possibilities of black youth free of negative stereotypes is the impulse that drives painter Martin Kegel. Subjects rendered through the lens of a black aesthetic represent the next generation of leaders. Here we have Randy and you featured in The Outside, which is the next painting we're going to look at, exude confidence as futurists who will fight for societal change. In your statement, you wrote, I split Afro and futurism into two parts. 
Afrofuturism into two parts, Afro and future. Picturing the way that the future might look through the lens of people that descended from Africa. The works that I have created are a way to picture this future. A future where black people have the confidence to be who they are, breaking free from stereotypes and preconceived notions of who they're supposed to be. The subjects of my work show themselves as they would like you to view them. So tell us why you chose existence as you think. Okay, so for me, yes. okay. So for me, I chose existence because with Afrofuturism, it's looking towards the future, and I just wanted to act on the future with my work and the way that people present themselves and show themselves. But with history, it's been a history of where the way that we exist has been determined by like other people. So if we go back to history a little bit, um, like I think like around the slavery time, there was like it's actually a painting at the Met, like in um, in New York, and it's of a white woman dressed in like a silk dress, and then she's um, surrounded by like her wealth, which is like she has like, flowers um, and a parrot. And then if you look in like in the shadow area areas and like in the background, there's like a little slave boy with like a freaking like a metal collar like around his neck, and he's not labeled. He's not like central to the painting. It's the woman that's the central piece of the painting. But the boy is used, he's labeled as like a commodity, adding to her wealth, and not the focus isn't towards him, just because of the painting. And then like moving forward from there, you go through like um like the Jim Crow laws and like um, the minstrels of the black phase and how stereotypes are then put on the black people and how they're supposed to look and how they act and how they dress. And then those stereotypes even from that period still carry on into today. So the way that we exist has always been um determined by people that don't exactly like aren't from the inner circle of like the black diaspora. Um, so with the work that I'm creating, I'm trying to like add on to the idea that we can exist according to the way that we view ourselves. So I give like the models control over their image instead of me, like I may be black, but like, I'm not that person. So me um, giving them control over what they do allows them to take back um, their image and exist the way that they see themselves as instead of me implying an image or an idea over them. So I chose existence just to emphasize the way that people want to exist instead of how we were like meant to exist through the eyes of somebody else who isn't a part of who we are. So I, I assume then that in creating your work, it is about self-identity and representation. And you allow your subjects to dress themselves as they choose. Yeah. You don't uh, give any specifications in terms of what attire they need to wear, yep. even how they pose, correct? Yep. And you just think it's a very free sort of um, environment that you choose. Um, and then who do your subjects tend to be? Okay, so because um, I'm doing like a general overview of like um, just black people in general and trying to break the stereotypes, I don't really pick and choose who the subjects are. Sometimes, when I first started, they were family members because that's who I had access to. But I'm trying to branch outward and trying to get people, like, there are a variety of people, honestly. So, like, people ask me, like, I take on volunteers because um, I just want different people just to branch out and show that black people don't exist within one idea of what a person looks like. They could be dark, they could be light, they could be, like, medium skin tone, they could dress over the top, they could be really calm. So, basically, I'm just trying to get Anybody, so I'll like ask different people who look different, and then people who volunteer or like ask me, can they be painted? I'll most likely say yes, because I'm just trying to get like a general overview of what black people can look like, so that people get out of this idea that it's only one I, like one category that they fit into. So you're trying to create work that is a representation of our community. Yeah, the way we dress, the way we present ourselves, because. In conversations that we've had in the past about your work, you expressed the concern that the way someone presents themselves to people actually within and outside of our culture might conclude that because someone, a guy, is wearing a certain type of jacket or hoodie, that um, that sends a signal that they may be, I think you called it, part of the, um, what is that, the zone? the threat zone, the immediate threat zone, meaning that their appearance somehow threatens 
someone else. Yeah. And and so you're creating imagery to combat those things. To yeah. Create a counter narrative to say what that you represent yourselves in this way because and I want you to finish that sentence. So of course we have the stereotype of like the black boy who wears a hoodie is dangerous, but. If I were, I'm hoping that with my work, you see a black boy wearing a hoodie and you see like his face. It doesn't look dangerous. It looks innocent. It looks um, it looks sweet. Like it, the danger isn't there. The danger that is um, supposedly prescribed with the hoodie is nowhere to be seen when you see the portrait. And I'm just hoping that um, when people like wear these, they're not afraid to describe themselves like or to go out in public wearing them with the fear that they'll be judged. But that um me page them normalize it for people so that they feel comfortable with it and like oh, okay I can do this and it looks it looks normal I can do this and it's not threatening. So you have created for the Venice exhibition Brandy, which is a young black woman. Mm -hmm. And then can we go to the next slide please? And then we outside. Yep. So can you tell us about the why who are the subjects in the we outside? And about the title, and what, what what was the impulse behind creating that work? Okay, so the one with Brandy, that was um, what most of my work looks like, where it's like a sub, like one subject, maybe multiple subjects, and they're they have control over the clothing that they're wearing, the pose that they're doing, and um, they're comfortable with themselves and the way that they pose, they can present themselves to me. Uh, but with we outside, this one is more of a, like a a different a different path. Where it's um, multiple figures. Oh, actually, that's me and my brothers, two of them, and um, it's more so talking about how people are comfortable in their environment rather than themselves. But like, because people, black people, um, sometimes can feel, you know, uncomfortable in spaces where you know, where you're not familiar, or you're like you're the only one there, and then you just don't feel right. But with this one, I'm trying to create like figures who are nonchalant, who are confident, who really aren't paying attention to where they are. And they still feel okay, even though like the background, like, it's like it's like a it's a neighborhood scene, but it's like it's like cold. You see like the snow, and but the figures they don't really care. And then like behind them, they also have like the fire, not like fire, but like sparks, kind of like the red flare. But the figures don't really pay attention. Um, they're not really um, like intimidated by where they are, they're just existing in their own world, no matter what the background, wherever the environment is, they just feel comfortable in themselves and they feel as if they're supposed to be there, no matter how dramatic the environment is. Excellent, thank you. I'm going to, um, well, let me ask you a couple of other questions. Like, what impact do you hope your work will have on viewers, particularly youth, and on the broader conversation about representation and so for youth, I would say more so, it's just it's confirmation and validating that the way that they dress, the way that they present themselves isn't, isn't bad. Because I know for me personally, when I was little, um, I got, um, you know, I was not like shamed, but like I was discouraged to dress a certain way because it wasn't the girly way of dressing because I was a little bit of a tomboy, you know what I mean? Um, but just letting them know that they can come as they are and then people can relate to it. Because people actually do relate to every single portrait. They'd be like, oh, I've seen this person before, even though they probably have not. Mm -hmm. um, they'd be like, oh. And there was a time I was actually presenting my work at a high school. And um, it wasn't like um, the portrait, but it was kind of like a street scene with a boy. And they related to it like, oh, shoot, he looks like us. Like, were, I wasn't, no, like, it was a group of boys. I wasn't with them, but I was listening to what they were saying. They're like, this looks just like us. So like, it's just um, a way for them to relate to it. Uh, and to see themselves in art, because art sometimes art isn't like acceptable or like a way for people to get into it. But like when you make work that looks like them and then um, engage them from a young age, they then can see themselves and then they can get into it as well. Yes, thank you. And um, what kind of message do you hope to convey to black youth and to those outside of the African American community, especially when it comes, we're talking about our future. So what, what message would you like to work to convey about Okay, so in regard, in regard to the future, I would say that, that, let me see. I would say that, you know, anything is, is possible. Um, and the, let me think about this for a second. Okay. 
Okay, for you, anything is possible because the way that we present ourselves is just depictions of who we are and our identity and that you don't have to hide it in the future. You can continue to show it no matter in what aspect you are and that you don't have to hide yourself. Even when you're young, um, children start out like they, they do start out like, like flamboyant or like expressive, but as they grow up, they tend to hide themselves and they fit into society and the way that they view themselves. Um, and they fit into the bubble. And sometimes they do fit into that stereotype, not like purposefully, but like as a way to blend in or as a way to like um, not be targeted, but just like, and I'm hoping that with my work, people get comfortable being who they are. That way they can move forward in the future and that they break free from the constraints that they like maybe unintentionally put themselves into and that they continue to move forward with like uh, self-confidence in who they are. That's a beautiful message. Thank you. So I'm going to move on to Tony, and if we could advance the slide to Tony, please. So Tony Chapman is a <coughs> photographer and mixed media artist um, whose works speak to existence. And from the curatorial statement, it is existence as portrayed in photos by Tony Chapman centers black children in Italian landscapes as a reaction against the historical eraser of blackness. In Tony's pastoral scenes series, Monique in Pastilla. I, I know I'm not saying that correctly. Pastilla. I, I, <laughs> I tried to I said it all over to Italy and not how to write it. <laughs> and Relisha in Pastilla are influenced by the work of 15th century Italian artists as the practice of Pestia, which I'm going to ask you about. They are adorned with African symbolisms, which celebrates their ancestry and affirms <coughs> their preciousness and humanity. In your statement about this series, this body of work, you said, when I think of the future, I think of my children and I have become intensively aware that the future does not belong to me, it belongs to them. As I look towards their tomorrow, I am seeking to demonstrate that we exist beyond the untruths, we exist beyond the atrocities afflicted upon our ancestors, we exist beyond the pain. Concurrently, as I step back and re-examine my I aim to illustrate that we also exist beyond the white backdrop. We live beautiful lives, deserving of celebration. We laugh, we love, and we always find a way to reclaim our joy. So Tanya, I ask you why you chose existence as a theme to create your work. Um, aside from the obvious that the subjects in my work, they exist. They're my children, my nieces, my nephews, godchildren, family. Um, I also took the opportunity, as it mentioned in the statement, to step back and re-examine my work and what I was saying and how it was presenting us. And so I decided that I wanted to focus on our joy. Um, I wanted to usually, as you know, I, I photograph my subjects on white, stark backdrops. And so I wanted to pull us out of that and juxtapose us into these historical paintings as a way to say we exist, we've always existed, um, in spite of the erasure, in spite of the historical misrepresentation. Um, and I wanted to show that aside from the atrocities, we love each other, we are over, we, we are joyful, um, and we exist beyond all of that. I also um, wanted, in a way, to reimagine what our lives would have been had they not been interrupted, so that also played a part in it as well. So beyond the beautiful work uh, that you 24 karat gold leaf, which is incorporated in all the other beautiful elements of the Sia, the, um, the technique that you created so that you have these, we're experiencing these textured surfaces. 
there is important symbolism that I would like to discuss. And particularly we want to unpack the work because they are so strikingly beautiful. But the messaging, the narratives buried within, I think, you know, that it's important that people understand what you're conveying through your imagery. So let's start, and, and I also want to share this so that when people leave the space and go back in and revisit the work, they'll look at it through a different lens, as with Monica's work and Belita's, so that, you know, they're so nuanced and powerful, um, and we would not want people to leave without having a full understanding of all of your intentions. So let's talk a little bit about, this is, um, <coughs> Okay, we have, let's start with Monique. And um, buried within her dress are many symbolisms, one of which is the Sankofa bird. So can you talk to us about why you chose to embed a Sankofa bird in her dress? Yeah, so I, I don't know if you had a question that asked about the Sia, but I kind of wanted to, yes, please, to mention why. So I actually, I thought I was creating my own technique <laughs> of um, you know, doing this textured work and then gilding with 24 karat gold leaf. And I later through research found that it was a technique used in Italy in the 15th century and it, it's called Castilla. And it was done to emulate metal work. And so I thought that it would be a good idea to continue to build upon that for Italy, for the Biennale. And so I wanted to make sure that in the textures and, and what I was creating that I was also honoring our ancestors at the same time. And so uh, Sankofa was introduced to me by my friend who's also one of the stylists, well, the stylist that um, styles a lot of my portraits. Um, and she's Haitian. And so that symbol you can find throughout the African diaspora. Um, and it, it comes from Ghana, and it means uh, go back and fetch. And it translates to uh, if it's OK to go back to the past and build a, a more beautiful future. And so I thought that was an important symbol to embed in the work. And, um... And then there are birds that are also featured in her garment. Can you talk to us about the seals and the birds? And so birds are also um, symbolically, they are between the heavens and the earth. And so they take messages from our ancestors and bring them down to earth to give them to us. So I, after my dad passed away, I kept seeing a bird. Um, we, uh, my whole family just kept saying words. So they made their way into my work, and then I thought it was important to, again, you know, honor our ancestors, the messages that they are giving us, and, and place them into this work. Beautiful. And the sun, the sun is also a part of one of the elements, visual elements that you incorporate. And the sun, divinity, um, close to the, the author of life, the source, and that's what we are. We are divine beings, we are <laughs> first humans. Um, so I thought that was also important to put into the work as well. And in both of the girls' dresses, um, Alicia being the other, there are flowers symbolized in their garments. Again, a way to honor our ancestors, the, the seeds that they planted, the flowers represent growth, um, and just the seeds that they left behind, and they're watching through us. We're blossoming and blooming, regardless, in spite of everything that continues to, to occur. And then, perhaps last but not least, because there are others, um, but the concentric circles are also found. Can you talk to us about the symbolism there? Again, concentric circles. Uh, can be found everywhere in, in nature. If you throw a, a rock into a pond, it creates these concentric, concentric circles. I'm sorry. 
um, tree stumps, the same thing. And so it's also, again, a representation of being close to nature, close to the creator, close to God. Now, let's talk about daycare, because um, your work is talking about celebrating black childhood. And in school systems, many states across this country, black hair is criminalized. And so tell us what, why the hair is important, the message that you're sending with the hairstyles that I think the young girls are wearing? Um, the hair plays a very large role in my work. Um, the big reason that I started, one of the reasons I started creating the work was uh, due to frustration, constantly hearing of little girls being sent home from school because of their hairstyles. Black boys can't wear cornrows always getting their locks cut off to, to participate in sports, and that was really frustrating to me. Um, and it's just my way to celebrate our hair, uh, to say that our hair is beautiful, and, and just to celebrate us as a whole. And then what messages would you like for your work to convey to black children now and in the future? Um, so, Historically, gold uh, was reserved for those of importance. And so, with my work, I'm framing us in gold. I am adorning us in gold. But I want black people, black children, people in the future to know that the subjects in the work are what is to be found, who are to be found, um, who are precious. going to try to bring Delita back into the conversation uh, because we do want to open it up for Q&A and I also have questions I want to pose all three of the artists. So um, are we able to reconnect with Delita now? Five minutes or Is Zelita with us? She's on the chat. Yeah, she's on the chat. Okay. I'm still having problems with feedback. So should I move on without her as part of the conversation? Sorry? Yes. Okay. All right. So I will pose my group questions then. So um, in creating your, our own, the History of African American Women Artists, author Lisa Farrington writes, a persistent theme in the art of African American women has been the configuration of their image without racial or gender stereotypes. Prompted by an unwelcome inheritance of axiomatic portrait portrayals that falsely define them as lustful, loathsome, and inferior, Many women artists of color have chosen to counteract these perversions by portraying themselves with dignity, honesty, and insight. As a woman and artist, please share with us the importance of creating positive portrayals of black women. I'll start with you. Okay. Um, so, for me, I'm a portrait artist, so I paint both men and women. But um, in regards to painting women in a, in a positive way, I think it's important because I think, well, in, in, for, in my experience, I feel like sometimes it's like a, a subconscious view of how women are a little bit lower than men. Um, I'll give an example. So on Instagram, people, like there was a little DM that came in and it was a man and it was like, oh, shoot. I didn't know a little girl like you could paint like that. And I was like, oh. I didn't think he, I don't know if he knew it was bad or not, but he said that. Um, 
And then I remember at another art show, um, there was a couple people, they were like, are you the artist? I was like, yeah. He's like, oh, shoot, I thought a man made me. And I was like, oh, OK. I don't think they meant anything by it, but that was just their, their thought process. And it seemed like subconsciously they thought like artwork that was good was seemingly made by a man. So for me, and portraying women, I do so as well as men, but uh, more so on the woman. Um, it's just I try to portray the figures in like a, a powerful, or like a, a confident light, just to emphasize the greatness um, and like their um, the emphasis on the, how they pose themselves, how they carry themselves with confidence. Um, but I'm hoping that with me working and showing um, the figures, it's just like not more so like an emphasis on the figures that I'm working, but like. With me painting the figures, I'm hoping that people can see like women have the same capability to create work the same way that men can create work in that way, and that in the future people don't underestimate um, like our skill sets, and that gender doesn't really equate to like capability, and to see that we're both like working at the same level. Yeah, that was beautifully stated, and that's part of the position that Lisa Farrington is driving that women are taking autonomy over the representation of their bodies and identity, and that historically what has happened is how we were portrayed was, of course, originally through a Eurocentric lens, and when um, portrayed by men, it may not have been as truthful as it would have been portrayed if it were done by a woman. So, Tani, why do you believe that it's I was trying to think if I purposely am creating, when I'm, when I'm creating, if I'm thinking it's important for me to create. And I'm not, I'm not sure that I'm purposely doing that. What's happening is it just is what it is. I am just telling the truth. I'm not telling the women that are standing in front of my camera to, to present yourself in this way. It just is who we are, and it is who they are. I think most importantly is that we tell our own stories so that they come across as truthful and we are able to show ourselves in that truthful light. That's great. Thank you. Um, share your perspective and the, on the future of Black women's art and its social, cultural, and political Um, share your perspective on the future of Black women's art and its social, cultural, and historical importance. Basically, what I'm getting at is, you know, your art will live on beyond our existence. It's just the nature of, of being a human being, and um, and so the legacy of that um, will remain, right? It, it becomes part of your legacy, and so it in creating the work and capturing our day-to-day -day experiences, it becomes almost an archival document, a documentation. And, and then it may be studied in the future. So knowing the burden of that <laughs> and the importance of what it is that you're creating, share your perspective on me. What does that really mean to you? If you think about it within that context, and, and that may not be the intention behind, or even the thought behind what, when you're creating. But putting it out there and asking you to contemplate that through that lens, what then do you think about that? How would you respond? How do you respond to the, now this other knowing about what your work means to, to us, to our community and to us? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, if I if I understand your question, I mean the first thing that I thought in my head is that black women are the future. Um, and we were also the past. Black women are always at the forefront of a lot of change that occurs in the world. So I think it's just a part of who we are. Um, but myself personally, I know that when I started creating, it was out of frustration. It was out of going, you know, from 
going to museums and not my children not seeing themselves or yeah, like those that they can relate to on the walls you were just bombarded with European art and, and these golden frames and so for me it was important that I I want to see something different that I step into that place and, and use the rest of my life to make use of the rest of my life to do that to leave something behind to, to to leave something special behind and, and into the world that I want them to grow up. And I'm not sure if that was what absolutely is. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, in regard to myself, I personally haven't thought about the long term, like when I'm gone and like what happens with the work. But I do know right now, like a lot of black women are in the spotlight with work, and then it's becoming uh, more prominent. And like you said earlier, like um. You have a, like a view into like the mindset of like through the woman's lens instead of through the male lens, and I think having that alongside like in the future it just gives people insight into the way that um like like two sides of the story like if you like portraiture you have it through the male lens and you have it through the female lens so you get a full story with the female uh, contribution to it. So I just feel like having that as a big part of history, um, it remains in the future is integral to like how people see the world. Okay, so I'm going to ask one more question. Um, and then I think we'll open it up to the floor. And that is, what did having your work shown at the Venice Biennale mean to you? I'm going to start with you. For me, yes. <laughs> I'm, a little, I'm a little baby, I'm 24. <laughs> so, for me, you took, a, you took like a little chance on me, and you were like, what, you weren't showing the Venice? I was like, okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, for me, it was an honor because um, I'm like, I'm like, I didn't really know the importance of the Venice Biennale, and I searched it up after she brought it up to me. I'm like, oh, oh, she wants my work there. <laughs> I was like, okay, cool. Um, but for me, it was an honor just to be in a place that's been around for like over 100 years, right? Yeah. 189 years. 189 years. Yeah. And then, yeah. Being a part of that and then being part of uh, the legacy, being the first black woman to create a show, right? Yes. Um, but uh, for me, it's just being this young, just being a part of something so big, just like, just an honor to be included. That's why I can say just an honor. I feel similar to Monica. I'm not a baby, <laughs> but um, I feel similar, and I, I feel honored. I feel that it, it. I I don't really know the magnitude of it at this point. Um, I felt that it was really special for me to be able to take my children to go over there and see that, see what happened and be a part of that. Um, I feel that it was important to show ourselves in that way, on that stage. Um, and I feel that it touched people, the messages that I received from people um, about the work and how they hadn't seen anything like that before. Um, and I thought, I think it was, Important too because when you go there, you see a lot of black awards and you see all of that there, and it's important to show ourselves and show who we are um, everywhere. So, um, I, mean, I don't know if we were successful in bringing Delita back. What we can do is we can grab Delita on the phone and we'll still turn Do you want to try it with my microphone? Yeah, I'm going to get feedback probably.
but you also see the um, bird on her, perched on her arm. And the bird has always been a symbol that I use in my work. I consider it part of my visual language. In that visual language, it, it means, it symbolizes the human spirit and our ancestors that we always carry with us at all times as a way of guiding us and helping us navigate through the spaces that we exist in. Okay, beautiful. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. Come with me to the place where I remember you. Well, first of all, tell us about the title. I love the title of that piece. Um, that particular piece is uh, actually a piece of my art. And um, the cone flowers that you see in the background talk about community and strength of community. And she's, I chose the color purple for her, well, a, a variation of purple for her, because it talks about, for me, purple symbol, symbolizes wisdom and power and strength. And that's what she, she, she stands to. So she's, she's a teacher. She's, she's let, come with me and let me teach you, let me show you, let me tell you about memory, about the, And part of your practice is creating what you coined the veilscape. Tell us, define that for us, and help us visually um, see that in your work. How is that? Um, how is that constructed in your your prints? Well, the veilscape. Um, so I talk about spiritual space. How we exist in the waking world and the spirit world at the same time. Okay. So <clears throat> the veil gave, I, I had to ask myself the question, you know, how do you visually use a visual language to describe a space that is intangible? And for me, that became color and texture. All of these things layered layers and layers of these on top of each other and for me it mimics life we you know there are struggles in life there are wonderful times in life and for me if you look for work there are times when the colors and the patterns and the textures marry together very well there's other spaces where you see tension and for me you see that in life you, you deal with that in spirituality as you as you go and so when you see the, the patterns and the textures and um, the colors moving in and out of the figure, that is referencing how these women exist in this space and how they are transitioning in and out and becoming their spiritual other, their spiritual selves. Thank you. Um, another important component to your work is the hand stitching. Tell us about the tradition of that and how that came about. <clears throat> so my grandmother was a quilt maker and um, I would help her at night make quilts. And I was in charge of cutting out the, and um, she taught me the, the one stitch that I use in my work and she called it tacky. And then she would go through and she would make a more secure stitch. Tack the, um, tack the base quilt together and then she would go back and, and again, like I said, do the, the more secure stitch. But during this time, she would tell me stories. She would tell me stories about myself when I was little, my stories about me. And so what I realized was happening was that she was piecing together and stitching together who I was and my identity. And I wanted to share that type of conversation not only with the viewer as well, I wanted to experience how we pull together um, our histories, our stories, and you know our lives. Before we go on to the seeker, I wanted you to share with us the symbolism behind the earrings, which is uh, an element that's often incorporated into many of your prints as well. I was around um, six months old when I first got my ears pierced. And I 
had a more true bigger theories ever since. And so the circle is something that you see in my work, um, whether it's a male figure or a female figure, because it represents the female. And so can you repeat that, please? The role theory. Uh, Delita. Initiation into this space, this new realm of who you are or who you are going to be. Okay, great. Um, we're going to advance now to the seeker. And talk to us about the mask that the figure is wearing. I use the mask and figuratively um, throughout my work. And it is used as a conduit for transition. It is used as a transitional item. Um, the things that we use um, to transition us in and out of the landscape, in and out of the waking world. And so that's why I use that. And we missed the first part of what you were trying to explain in terms of space, and why you chose space as a theme to draw from in creating these pieces. And can you also talk to us about what your work is saying in regards to the future of Black women? Well, I feel that Black women are quite many walls. Um, you know, that term that we wear many hats. And um, in doing so, we occupy different spaces. And even, you know, we even birth to, into spaces, into the world. But historically, we are relegated to certain spaces and often put in our places. So it was important for me to work with the idea of space as a black woman to create a space, not just to exist, but a space to thrive. And that's what I wanted to do with this work. That's beautiful. So I'll ask one last question, and then we're going to open up the floor. And that is, what do you Having your work shown during the Venice Biennale mean to you? Wow. <laughs> um, it was such a humbling moment for me um, to have my work seen and have not just my story, because I, I feel like it wasn't just for me, it was for Black women all over the world to be seen on a world stage. But I wanted to offer not just. Um, a different narrative. I wanted to offer a true narrative of who we are and who we can be. Um, I feel that it's very important for me as an artist, as a black woman, to tell my story, my mother's story, my sister's story, the women in my community to tell their story, the true story, not, um, a, not just a different narrative, but something that holds true to who we are, the amazing, diverse people Oh, thank you. That's a beautiful answer. Um, we're going to open up the floor now for questions. We have I'm very joyful for this conversation, first of all, to see artwork at a very high level. Um, it's just so refreshing. <laughs> uh, and, I, and the question I have, actually, I would like all three artists to answer. I'll start with Tani, who's just incredible. She's a self-taught bonus artist, y'all. She's self-taught. Oh, my God. <laughs> but I know as artists, I'm an artist as well. My name is Jenny Mark. Um, I know as artists, we can be influenced by a lot of different things, not just other artists, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd actually like each artist to take a more deeper dive into um, what influenced uh, your artwork, your journey in particular, uh, at the time, your journey, you know, how did you get to this point, you know, working at this level and the subtext and, you know, all of that, uh, et cetera, to other influences. Are you and come up on the stage? <laughs> um, I'm gonna try not to get emotional because that's the way that I started creating the work always makes me get emotional. 
emotional. So I, I'm not going to do it today. Um, <laughs> uh, I was a commercial photographer for a very long time. Um, my dad was diagnosed with prostate cancer. I documented his battle with prostate cancer. Uh, we ended up losing my father to prostate cancer and just felt that I wanted to do something more important with my life um, a few years after that. And I still did commercial photography, but it just started not feeling right. And then all of the other things that I've mentioned, uh, going to museums with my children, uh, hearing about black children being sent home from school because of the way that we wear our hair, uh, Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, and just everything that we constantly are dealing with. Um, I wanted to make use of myself, and that's how it started for me. Okay, so for me, um, for me, I've always been drawn to portraiture. Like, um, I started painting when I was in high school, when I was like maybe 15 years old. Um, and they always they give us assignments like you know paint like still lives, paint animals, paint landscapes, paint people. I've always been drawn to painting people. And then uh, in college, that's when I started like having like a focus where you like divert from the assignments and you work on what you want to do, your own ideas. And I had done a series of like five paintings, three, um, you know, five large scale paintings, and they were of um, black males, and then they had like a red light reflected on their faces, and there was like a pattern in the background reflecting a form of violence that they were associated with. Um, and I did that, and I realized um, I am painting images that are feeding into um, the ideas of how black men were seen in society. So then I decided um, I should flip it around. And then that's when I decided, let me make images that are more um, influenced by the way that people wanted to be seen. So now, when I uh, get volunteers to uh, like model for me, I don't have, I don't say anything. All I do is just snap the picture. So they can take control of their clothing. They bring the props, they bring the accessories, they choose um, the way they're gonna stand and pose. If they wanna bring in other people, they have full control. So I'm not saying anything now. Before I used to like, um, it was just, I just think, didn't think it was right to feed into like the idea of what society has already proclaimed over and over again, that black males are violated. And so I just decided, let me just flip it and work with the, the subject to create their own ideas. Did you hear the questions? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, so I don't remember ever not creating art. Um, I didn't realize this until I was much older, like graduate school old. Um, that I grew up pretty much in an art school. I grew up in a creative environment. My father was a painter who studied with John Biggers, who actually gave me my first critique and really helped me to understand and tasked me with the challenge of, you know, uplifting my people in my work. And so I've always created, um, it started from, from coloring books to um, copying my father's work, copying John Baker's work, and any other artists whose work I like, and then eventually um, evolved into me finding my own voice. So um, there was never, ever a plan B. So I'm glad I that. <laughs> any other questions? Yeah. Um, you all were all asked what the, uh, being uh, at the Biennale meant uh, to you. Can you ask, answer for me what you think your being there meant to the Biennale and to Venice and to the viewers who passed through there? Did you hear the question? Yes. Okay. Um, why don't you answer first? Go ahead. Okay. Um, I think for the people of Germany, it was eye opening. Um, I, I feel like for the people that I spoke to in the African American community and at large, um, it meant a lot because in my mind and in my conversations, it wasn't just for me, it was for all of us. 
it was for all of us to stand on the, in the international stage and say, I am here, you will see me, and you will know that I am not the stereotypes of Manny, Jezebel, Sapphire, Sambo, or any of these other things. I am here. So um, I think that's what it meant. At least I hope that's what people took away. Oh, okay, so I didn't get to go out to Venice, unfortunately. Um, but for me, I'm hoping that with our presence there, not just one of me, but like all of us together for the show, I'm hoping that it just, um, you know, it gives an emphasis onto like the fact that we're on equal ground with the other big galleries that usually get a spot there, and that um, black galleries have an equal footing and can get into places that are reserved for um, more, I don't know, what you would call it, more established, more white, I don't know. But, but that we have the equal footing and we have the, um, just like the leader said, we have the share and the spotlight as well. That's a good question. I never thought about it. Um, but I guess I hope the same thing that I hope with my work that whoever came across it wanted to dive more into who we are, what we're talking about and the issues that we're speaking about in our work so that worldwide these things are handled and, and thought about and dealt with. Ms. Fedora, could you answer that? Yes, thank you. Um, for me, as a curator and a black woman, I mean, I really understand the historic importance of our presence there. The exhibition, its title, <coughs> and the work that was presented was done so to put our concerns on a global platform. Uh, as Alita said, to see us as we truly are, um, as important, creative, intelligent individuals who have something to say about our past, our present, and our future. Our presence, present, and our future. Presence. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I know that the exhibition was visited by uh, at least 100,000 individuals and um, because they had someone there at the entrance, at, you know, as the uh, visitors came, there was tremendous support. The exhibition won awards and received several acknowledgments and articles. So we felt heard, we felt seen, and uh, and I think that those are some of the most important things, at least for me as a curator. And also I should add, uh, I'm very grateful for the um, museum embracing the idea to allow for your exhibition to be shown here so that it could be shared with those who were not able to visit Venice, with our Baltimore community, the state of Maryland, and of course the nation. Why I've received emails from folks that have traveled down from New York. Um, so the word has started to spread that the exhibition is here, and I'm just so proud that it's being received so well. Any other questions? Uh, Delita, you got cut short a little bit. I wondered if there was anything else that you wanted to add before we end the program. Again, um, I would like to thank you, and I would like to thank the museum, um, like you said, for bringing the work here to um, share with our home base, and thank you for believing in your artists and helping us to, you know, navigate this space, you know, the space for the future. So. Thank you for that, and, um, and I'd like to thank the audience for the wonderful question. <laughs> thank you. Did you want to make any last comments? I think we do have one last question. Oh, we have one more question. I'm sorry, I'm just going to hand back here. Uh, my question is, uh, what part of you or what you've done is my question? Like, what part of where you are or what you've done as an artist, would your younger self be most proud of? Like, uh, I know as artists, we carry out of our hearts, and we always, artists, as we were born, and 
I was out in the cells, I didn't see you look up. Man, I get so excited. And I just wonder, like, what is that thing for the other person? <laughs> The question was that I'm repeating it for Talia. Like, what, what, as an artist, what, repeat it again, what, what would your younger self be most proud of? Oh, what would your younger self be most proud of? Yeah, like, what part, I mean, like, where you are on what you've done as an artist, what your younger self be most proud of? Okay, what part of you and what you've done are you most proud of? I guess I would say, kind of like what Lee said, like staying, like sticking to the ideas that I have. Um, the way that I paint is um, a little bit like, it's like realism, but like illustrative. But for me in school, it was really not encouraged to paint that way. So I've had teachers that would try to like get me to stop what I'm doing and to paint like, you know, like the old masters, like, like Rembrandt and stuff like that. Um, but just me like staying headstrong, being like a little stubborn in the head. Um, and sticking to the ideas that I wanted and developing my style and just sticking with that has brought me to where I am to the point where um, the work you see now, and people can point it out like, oh, that's so Monica. Um, but sticking with that and also um, just um, like a focus. Like if I wasn't focused when I was younger, I probably wouldn't be where I am right now. So I would say um, sticking with the ideas, the concepts that I have, not letting one get into my head and also just the focus and the time management and dedication that I've kept over the years. That's a good question too, because I was just zoning out trying to think about it. Um, I think that uh, when I think about where I am right now and what I'm doing right now, it most aligns to who I am in, inside. And growing up, I was also in dramatic arts, but when I think of why I was in dramatic arts and what I wanted from it, it was accolades. Um, even in commercial photography, when I think of why I wanted the clients that I wanted, it was for accolades. I wanted these big clients so I could have them on my resume. And once I started creating work that meant something to me, my life felt better. It just felt better. I didn't even know it was gonna receive any of the accolades that it received at this point and when anyone asked me to inter do an interview I'm like huh what wait no <laughs> you know it's different when you when you're creating for yourself and people aren't listening versus doing it so people you doing it for people you know? so I just feel I would be most proud of that that I listen to myself and I trust in myself um, and I'm able to organically create what's true to myself. Any other question? Oh, we have I should one? probably ask this one. I should probably ask this one because um, you know, I've seen the exhibition. I and, think it should be on my uh, feed so that we can hear your question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've seen the exhibition. I've seen the exhibition and particularly impressed with the global perspective and the inclusion of Ghana. 
um, in this exhibition. And perhaps the artist could speak to um, any global experience, connection with, I'm going to leave it at that, <laughs> with, not only with Africa, but our global world. I don't know. <laughs> I, hope, I hope that question was good. <laughs> I don't want to leave the question too much. I just, you know. But it, I mean, it is significant that, you know, that Africa is present in this exhibition, the curator, of course, but uh, in terms of the other artist's relationship to the presence of Africa, okay, in this exhibition. Um, what are your feelings about that? <laughs> um. The presence of Africa um, in the exhibition. So Berita has not seen the reinterpretation of the exhibition. The African art pieces were incorporated by the curation of the uh, individuals here on staff. So the African art that's present was not part of the Venice experience. So it was expanded upon and reimagined in the space, which is a beautiful complement to everything that the exhibition was created to do, to show those ancestral ties. The <coughs> Afrofuturist is, you know, the uh, as was stated during the opening reception, you know, the concept, the philosophy, well, the, not the philosophy, but the term was coined. Mark Geary, who even questioned um, our ability to have cultural ties, like for people who were separated from their motherland, how could they conceive of having a culture? And my position on that is that it was brought over these traditions in the in bodies of the enslaved. We are benefiting from those traditions and those cultures that were never lost. And, and they are embraced and they are shown um, through the works of the artists that are in the show. So the, um, again, the curators here sought to expand upon that narrative and marry them, so to speak, and they bring the African art pieces as, into the conversation. Sorry. This is the last okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I just happened to be in Venice in October. Oh, Your nice. exhibition just happened to be around the corner from our hotel. So yeah, I just feel very fortunate. Um, uh, but there was also the, um, we went over to, I guess, where the countries featured the artists. Yes, yes. And the, uh, there was a yes. black woman featured for the United Somali. States, Moni, mm -hmm. and uh, Great Britain had a black woman, and I heard that Ireland did, but I never mm -hmm. made it over there. Was this the year of black girl magic, or is this it something was. that will continue? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, Simone being there is, you know, historic, unprecedented. She's only the second African-American to represent the US with Robert Colescott being the first, I believe it was in, I forget the year, it was in 1998, I could be wrong about that, 98. Um, and then Simone being the representative in 2022, and then Gallery Matisse being the representative of uh, the, curation, the, the exhibition, you know, for, we were invited by the European Cultural Center for Berlin. So, yeah, there was a lot of black power for this. We brought it, didn't we? I mean, Simone's exhibition was just mind blowing, otherworldly. Our exhibition um, was created with black walls, which was very intentional on my part because I wanted people to be engulfed in blackness when they're walking into that space, to be surrounded by it. It was our universe, our utopian universe, with uh, conversation around, you know, our future, our social, political concerns, um, our fight against racism and stereotypes and uh, white supremacy. 
So I, you know, it just was a absolutely powerful experience. And then to have it here, I mean, wow, to be able to share this with our community, your presence here tonight is validation of how important it is for us to be in a space where it's safe to do that, uncensored. Um, it's just, it's just an honor and a privilege to be in a position to do that. Thank you. So I think we will wrap it up now. We want to thank everyone for coming out this evening um, for this uh, first program, inaugural program for um, Black Teachers, uh, Black Imagining. Um, as mentioned before, we'll be having programming throughout um, from March through September 5th. Uh, please check out our website. We'll actually have our upcoming events um, next month. We will be showing Afrofuturism, the origin story uh, by the Smithsonian Channel on April 1st, uh, as long as a uh, short uh, Afro, sorry, short um, film, Amethyst Love Thoughts. And then we will be uh, showing our first Friday's music series will be showing um, heavy performers dealing with music that connects with Afrofuturism. So our first show will be with Nabasha Day at the Malcolm X Middle Press. Uh, one of her songs is on our playlist in the uh, exhibition. And then lastly, in April, we will have a panel talk, Be More Imaginarium, the social experience that we had a chance to go downstairs to our first floor art gallery. Um, we will have a talk about what are people doing regionally using futurism in applicable ways on the community grassroots level before that exhibit ends. So we want to thank you for coming out this evening. We know that there are a lot of things that you could be doing, but you took your time to come out today. We want to also thank you for your patience. We know that we were having a lot of techno issues, but you hung in there with us, and I'm sure that you got, got um, a lot from the conversation today. And with that, there will be a talk with the gentleman, yeah. the uh, gentleman of our investigation as well. So this yes. is our women's history of investigation. Yeah. Look, look for that in uh, July and August. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.